Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. Here's our book, Introduction to World Philosophy. In this video, we are going over the Bhagavad Gita, which is the conversation between Arjuna and Krishna. And we're going to be reading about the Bhakti movement of the Lady Bhakti poets. And we're going to be comparing that Bhakti philosophy as found in the Bhagavad Gita and in the, the poetry to Buddhism. So this is in preparation for exam four, and this is the last part of our class. We're going back to the beginning of the book, which is ethics. And I said at the beginning of this class that I'm, I started with part two of the book, which is about what is the self. And then we ask the questions, what is knowledge? What is reality? And now, because it seems to me to answer the question, what should I do or who should I be? First, you got to know who or what am I? What is real? What can I know? So we've been through those three questions and now we're to the ethics question. And we're going to start off as usual chronologically, which takes us to the Hindu philosophy and then the Buddhist philosophy. So the questions we'll be going over in this video are uh, part B, uh, one and two, the first and the second one in the Bhagavad Gita. Why does Krishna tell Arjuna that the learned men grieve not for the living nor the dead? And then we'll answer the question, in what way do the women bhakti poets, so Akka, Janabi, Lala, and Mirabi, fulfill Krishna's advice to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita? And then the part A question is, how is Buddha's philosophy in the first sermon, which is the Four Noble Truths, and the Dhammapada, similar to and different than the bhakti philosophy described by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita and the bhakti poets. Okay, so we're going to start with that first question about why does Krishna tell Arjuna not to grieve for the living or the dead? And so the scene of the Bhagavad Gita is a battlefield and there's a civil war about to take place between the Pandavas, the sons of Pandu, <clears throat> and the sons of Dhritarashtra, the blind king. So they're cousins. It's one side of cousins versus the other. Who should take the throne? And the Pandavas are the rightful heirs to the throne, and they're fighting the evil son of Dhritarashtra and his army. So Duryodhana is the evil son of the blind king. So as the battle's about to begin, Arjuna tells Krishna, so Krishna's Vishnu. We saw in the Upanishads that Vishnu is the name for God, the, the source of everything, the source of Atman and Brahman, the highest goal of life. So Krishna is a form of Vishnu. In the Bhagavad Gita, he claims to be the source of all Vishnus, the source of everything. But at any rate, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is presenting himself as the all the all-knowing, all-powerful God, and he is incarnated as Arjuna's cousin. So they're in there. Krishna is serving as the chariot driver. Arjuna's the passenger. He's got his bow. He tells Krishna, "Take me in between the two armies to let me see who's fighting here." And when Arjuna sees his cousins and uncles and fathers and sons and everybody getting ready to slaughter each other, he becomes distraught and he drops his bow on the ground and he tells Krishna that I will not fight. He, he, it says on page six over on the left hand column, uh, Oh, son of Prita, look at these assembled karvas. That's what Krishna said to Arjuna. Uh, there the son of Prita saw in both armies fathers and grandfathers, preceptors, maternal uncles, brothers, sons, grandsons, companions, fathers-in-law, as well as friends, and, seek, and seeing all those kinsmen standing there, the son of Kunti was overcome by excessive pity and spake thus despondingly. So he says, my hair stand on end, the bow slips from my hand, my skin burns, I see bad omens, I do not perceive any good to accrue after killing my kinsmen in the battle. He said, even those for whose sake we desire sovereignty, enjoyments, and pleasures are standing here for battle, abandoning life and wealth. 
preceptors, fathers, sons, with all of his family and friends, these I do not wish to kill, though they kill me, O destroyer of Mado, even for the sake of sovereignty over the three worlds, how much less than for this earth alone, what joy shall be ours, O Janardana, after killing Dhritarashtra's sons. Killing these felons, we shall only incur sin, therefore it is not proper for us to kill our own kinsmen, the sons of Dhritarashtra, for how, O Madhava, shall we be happy after killing our own relatives? So notice, he's worried about not being able to have joy and happiness. If he slaughters his family members, he'll be forever grieving for the rest of his life. He'll incur horrible sins, which could lead him to hell, and so he just doesn't want to do it. So this is how Krishna responds. The Blessed One said, How comes it that this delusion, O Arjuna, which is discarded by the good, which excludes from heaven, and occasions infamy, has overtaken you in this place of peril. Be not effeminate, O son of Prata, it is not worthy of you. Cast off this base weakness of heart, and arise, O terror of your foes. So Arjuna says, no, I don't want this blood-tainted enjoyment. It's better for us to just let them kill us. Um, then he says, tell me assuredly, this is page 7, tell me assuredly, uh, tell me what is assuredly good for me. I am your disciple. Instruct me who have thrown myself on your good will, for I do not perceive what is to dispel that grief which will dry up my organs, even if I shall have obtained a prosperous kingdom on earth without a foe, or even the sovereignty of the gods. And then he just says, I shall not engage in battle. So then Krishna says to him, you have grieved for those who deserve no grief, and you, and yet you talk words of wisdom. So he's being sarcastic. Then he says, learned men grieve not for the living nor the dead. So there's the first part B discussion question for exam four. So why do the learned men grieve not for the living nor the dead? So Krishna goes on to say, never did I not exist, nor you, nor these rulers of men, nor will any one of us ever hereafter cease to be, as in this body, infancy and youth and old age come to the embodied self so does the acquisition of another body. A sensible man is not deceived about that. So the soul doesn't die. That's his main point. You can't be destroyed. You can't burn it. You can't destroy it with water or wind or any of the elements. It's eternal. It's never been created. It'll never be destroyed. You'll only reincarnate. So that is the ultimate answer for why learned men grieve not for the living or the dead. Because... That's all having to do with the material body, and we should be able to realize we are not the material body. We are a soul that is in a material body. The material body is always changing from childhood through old age to death, and then you get a new one. On page uh, 7 on the right-hand column, he says, As a man casting off old clothes puts on others and new ones, so the embodied self casting off old bodies goes to others and new ones. <clears throat> Weapons do not divide it into pieces, fire does not burn it, waters do not moisten it, the wind does not dry it up, it is not divisible, it is not combustible, it is not to be moistened, it is not to be dried up, it is everlasting, all-pervading, stable, firm, and eternal. It is said to be unperceived, to be unthinkable, to be unchangeable, therefore knowing it to be such, you ought not to grieve. So that is the crux of the lesson there. And then he, Krishna goes on to say, you should... Focus on doing your duty without any attachment to the fruits of your actions. So that's another big part of Krishna's ethics here, which we'll be getting into when we go over Immanuel Kant. He says the same thing. You should act only out of respect for duty, not out of any concern for reward or punishment. Okay, so I will be coming back to the Bhagavad Gita, but I'm going to move now to the bhakti movement so there are let's see here i think there's four lady poets two worshipers of shiva and two worshipers of krishna but they are advocates of the bhakti of bhakti yoga so bhakti yoga is the yoga of meditating on god with the spirit of devotional service and love so um, I'll actually go back for a, a moment to the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna introduces Bhakti Yoga. So first he's telling Arjuna that you have to fight because it's your duty. 
your duty as a warrior, a kshatriya. That's what kshatriyas do. Do your duty, otherwise people will mock you for being a coward, and you'll be, you know, it's, for people who have been honored by others, it's worse than death to then be dishonored. So just fight and do your duty. But then on page eight, he goes on to say, the left-hand column about halfway down, he says, the knowledge here declared to you is that relating to samkhya, understanding, so philosophy of the soul and the cosmos. Now hear that relating to the yoga, self-discipline. So that means bhakti yoga. Possess, possessed of this knowledge, O son of Prita, you will cast off the bonds of action. In this path to final emancipation, nothing that is commenced becomes abortive, no obstacles exist, and even a little of this form of piety protects one from great danger. So he goes at the bottom, he's saying, don't worry about the fancy words of the Vedas that tell you how to get a better body in the next life. You shouldn't be concerned with the fruits of your actions. On the right-hand column, he says, your business is with action alone, not by any means with fruit. Let not the fruit of action be your motive to action. Let not your attachment be fixed. Let not your attachment be fixed on inaction. Having recourse to yoga, O Dananjaya, perform actions, casting off all attachment and being equable in, su in success or ill success, such equability is called the yoga. So equability, equanimous, be equal minded. Oh, it's a great success. Now I'm rich. Oh, it was a horrible failure. Now I'm poverty stricken. That's all material energy that has nothing to do with the soul. So Krishna is saying that doesn't matter. What matters is that you focus your mind on serving God. That's bhakti yoga. And that's how you'll get out of the cycle of reincarnation and achieve a peaceful mind. You won't be overly happy when you gain something. You won't be overly distressed when you lose something that you like. But um, so on the bottom there, Krishna says, a man's mind is steady. This is page eight, right hand column. A man's, man, uh, a man's mind is steady when he withdraws his senses from all objects of sense as the tortoise withdraws its limbs from all sides. Objects of sense draw back from a person who is abstinent, not so the taste for those objects, but even the taste departs from him when he has seen the Supreme. So he, Krishna is claiming to be the Supreme. The boisterous senses, O son of Kunti, carry away by force the mind even of a wise man who exerts himself for final emancipation, restraining them all. A man should remain engaged in yoga, making me his only resort for his mind is steady, whose senses are under his control. So, making me his only resort is the key phrase for bhakti yoga. Krishna is proclaiming himself to be the supreme source of being. He's claiming to be God, the supreme Vishnu. To see Krishna is to have all of your sense desires satisfied. So you won't be attracted by material pleasures just focus on Krishna and serving him. That's his advice. That's bhakti yoga. Take your mind and it's going all over the place for this desire and that desire and fame and fortune. And just think of Krishna and then you'll become tranquil and peaceful, at least in regards to the material world. You'll be a steady minded person who's not overly affected by material circumstances. Okay, but however, we're going to see, although you will have a tranquil mind in regard to material circumstances, the goal is to have a, a certain kind of divine madness focusing on Krishna with a spirit of love. That's what the bhakti poets are going to show us right now. Now, two of them were worshippers of Shiva and two were worshippers of Krishna, but the idea of loving God and serving God and losing your mind in love of God, that's bhakti yoga. And that is how they fulfill Krishna's advice to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, by just making Krishna or, or Shiva, making the Supreme Lord their only resort, just focusing all their mind on God. So the four bhakti poets that we're going to be going over are Akka Mahadevi, so she was born in the 12th century. She's a Shiva worshiper. Uh, she was a very beautiful woman, and she didn't want to get married, but she agreed to marry the king of a kingdom if he allowed her to associate with the other devotees of Shiva. 
but he got jealous and wouldn't let her do it. So then she left him and went around naked like the male ascetics. The male Shiva worshippers would sometimes walk naked just to show their renunciation of, of externals. So we'll read some of her poetry. The next poet will be Janabi, and she worships Krishna in the, in the form of Vital. Vital is another name for Krishna. And she was born in a low caste family. Her parents died, and then she was adopted by a, a family of devotees of Vital. And one of their sons, Namdev, was an important poet. And so Janabi was his servant throughout life. And they, he inspired her, and she was influenced by him, it says on page 10. And so she writes about her love for Krishna. She accepted Krishna as her husband. It's generally all four women accept God as their husband, and that's how they overcome attachment to the material world. Then we have Lala. So she's 14th century, born into a family of Brahmins. She worships Shiva. She also occasionally wore no clothing like the, the men, ascetic devotees of Shiva. And finally, we will go over the poetry of Mirabi. So she was writing in the sixth, early first part of the 16th century. To a, she was born to a Kshatriya family uh, in Rajasthan. And she considered herself married to Krishna. And the point is, at the bottom of the right hand, uh, the bottom of page 11 in the introductory notes, only the most extreme devotion liberates us from illusion. So that's how you, according to the bhakti yogis, the way to liberate yourself from illusion, from maya, the, uh, the material realm, the way to free yourself from the illusion that you are the material body, and therefore that its desires are your desires, is extreme devotion to God, an extreme madness. So madness is the goal. So that's not a tranquility of the mind in the usual sense of the word, but it is a peace from all material desires, is how they describe it, by being overwhelmed with the desire for the love of God. So I'll just read a few excerpts from each and link it back to the Bhagavad Gita, because that's the question. How do, their, how do these bhakti poets fulfill the advice that Krishna gave to Arjuna? And the advice was to make me your only resort, we saw on page 9. Ultimately, that's what he said. Don't worry about anything else. Do everything as service to me. That's what Krishna is saying, because I'm the supreme source of everything. So on the right-hand column of page 11, Akka Mahadevi says, I have fallen in love, O mother, with the beautiful one who knows no birth and knows no fear. She said, uh, Chena, Chena Malik Arjuna. That's another name for Shiva. They have, they have a lot of names after their pastimes. And once Shiva fought Arjuna, and when Arjuna hit him with arrows, the arrows turned to flowers. And um, so that's part of that name. So at any rate, Chena Malik Arjuna, the beautiful, is my husband. Fling into fire husbands who are subject to death and decay. O Lord, listen to me if you will. If you will, listen not if you will not. I cannot rest contented unless I sing of you. So she's saying, you can do what you want but I'm just going to think of you all the time. That's all I can do. She says, even if I want to stay apart, your Maya will not leave me. So now she's, she's complaining about Maya, the illusions that come with identifying yourself with the body. Even if I struggle against it, this Maya stays unbroken. Your Maya doesn't leave, even if one stands firm. Those struggling to break this Maya are themselves broken. I'm skipping around a little. She says, if one goes into the deep forest, Maya goes along. Oh, samsara, that's the cycle of reincarnation. It does not leave my back, my hands. It gives me faith and then makes me forget. Oh, mercy maker, I am afraid of your maya. Oh, supreme master, chena, malik, arjuna, jasmine, tender, have mercy. What else, oh, what shall I do? Oh, great God, oh, snake adorned one, do have mercy, oh, God. Then she later talks about uh, holding back the horse and dragging it to stand still on the beautiful pedal. So holding back the horse... We saw in the Kathu Upanishad that, the, that the, the body is the chariot and the horses are the senses, and you have to restrain your sense desires. That's what she's talking about. And also here she gets, the imagery has to do with Kundalini Yoga. So Shiva worshippers focus on 
the chakras. You probably heard of the these centers of energy along your spine, starting at the base of the spine and then to the navel and then one in the heart and then the throat and the between the eyes and then at the top of the head. So if you control your breath, the imagery is raising the goddess Shakti, Shiva's wife, from the base of the spine up the channels of the spine, these subtle material channels called nadis, to a reunion with Shiva, and then you have this en enlightenment experience. So I'll just read a little bit of that. She says, over the incense burner of the prime basis, placing the embers of the heart center and stopping the wind by the breath, the heat of that fire touches the crown crevice. The pot of ambrosia breaks and showers onto the heart center. Then the light of the wonderful jewel can be seen. Who is there to know this, O Lord, other than the egoless devotee, the devotee who knows the here and the hereafter and knows what the five senses need? Only the, devo only the devotee who has left the body who will know you other than your devotee. So to know God, you have to serve God with love. That's the way to remember the eternal knowledge of the soul. It's not through studying the scriptures. It's not through rolling around in ashes. It's through love of God. That's the message of the Bhakti Yogas. She says at the bottom there, she says, all the Vedas, scriptures and sacred lore, canons and codes are but grist and husk ground in the mill. Why grind this? Why winnow? When you behead the mind that flows here and there, O Chena, Malik, Arjuna, Jasmine, Tender, then remains eternal space. So she's dismissing the need for the Vedas. That is something Krishna also did on the bottom of page, le uh, the left column of page eight. He says that the people who are enamored with the flowery talk of the Vedic words, who say there's nothing else, who are full of desires and whose goal is heaven, He's dismissing these people. The Vedas merely relate to the effects of the three qualities. Do you, O Arjuna, rise above those effects of the three qualities and be free from the pairs of opposites? Always preserve courage. Be free from anxiety for new acquisitions or protection of old acquisitions and be self-controlled. All right, so that's just another similarity. All the Vedas, says Akka Mahadev, all the Vedas, scriptures, and sacred lore, canons and codes are but grist. All right, so... The overemphasis on the Vedas is not going to save your soul. Just the love of God is, is going to do that. And so now I'm going to move to Janabi, the worshiper of Krishna, also known as Vital. So let me just go back and uh, Janabi, born 1260, died around 1350. So she was born to a low caste family and then she was adopted by a a family of Vishnu worshippers and she helped raise one of their sons and then she stayed his servant and I guess he was teaching her about Krishna and apparently she was one of the famous bhakti yogis so Janavi on page 13 she says your wife and mother stay at your feet and sons are placed proudly in front this woman is kept on the doorstep, so she was raised this low caste orphan. No room for the lowly inside. Oh God, how I want your embrace. When will you call Dasi Johnny your own? I eat God, I drink God, I sleep on God, I buy God, I count God, I deal with God. And she's going to go on to talk about God a lot as a mother. Can the river reject its fish? Can the mother spurn her child? Johnny says, Lord, you must accept those who surrender to you. O oh Lord, you become a woman, washing me in my soiled clothes, like she's a baby, like you know, as if she was a baby. O oh Lord, I want a place at your feet, says Johnny. Nam Dave's Dasi. So Nam Dave was the boy that she helped to raise, who then became a famous poet. Um, so I'll just go over here on the left-hand column, of page fourteen. She says, "I see Krishna everywhere. I look to my left, and I see Krishna. I look to my right, and see Krishna." If I look down, Krishna's there. Everything I see, moving and unmoving, is radiating Krishna. Where am I? I don't recall anymore. Then at the end, she says, when this oneness is experienced, the illusion of separation vanished. So she wants to unite with love of Krishna. Now Lala, a Shiva worshiper, she'll also make some references to Kundalini Yoga. So she was born around 1320 died uh, around uh, 1390. Now, I think I messed up the dates for Janabi was 1260 to 1350. Lala, 1320 to 1390. She was born into a family of Brahmins, but she 
uh, renounced that kind of a life and became a wandering mendicant to some degree and walked around naked at times. But what we're really focusing on is just bhakti yoga. So on page 14, she says, my guru gave me only this advice from outside transfer the attention within that became my initiation. That is why I began to wander naked. I took the reins of the mind horse through practice. I learned breath control. Then only the orb of moon melted and flowed down into my body. So I think the orb of moon is a reference to Kundalini yoga. If you look at the tip of your nose and you control your breath, they call this, you know, you kind of cross-eyed when you do that, the orb of the moon and practicing breath. But it, um, so I'll continue here. She says, after traversing six forests, I awakened the orb of the moon by controlling my breath. I gave up attachment to worldly things. I burned my heart in the fire of love. Thus I found Shankar. So that's another name for Shiva. And then she talks about what is wrong with eating with people, with people from different castes or religions. So she dismisses the distinctions of caste in different religions. She says, I traversed the field of void alone and I, Lala, lost consciousness of myself. I found the secret of myself with a capital S. Then the lotus bloomed in the mud for Lala. I, Lala, entered the door to the garden of my mind. I saw Shiva and Shakti in communion and became immersed in the nectar of bliss. Now life and death are the same to me. Well, skipping down a little bit, she says, Whoever regards the self and the others as equal, and the day and the night is the same, whose mind is free of duality, she alone has the vision of the Lord of creation. So being free from opposites. That's some, another piece of advice that Krishna gave to Arjuna. If you look at page 8 on the left-hand column up near the top, Krishna's telling him what would happen if you fight. He says, killed, you will obtain heaven. Victorious, you will enjoy the earth. Therefore, arise, O son of Kunti, resolve to engage in battle, looking alike on pleasure and pain, on gain and loss, on victory and defeat. Then prepare for battle, and thus you will not incur sin. So Lala is giving the same advice rise beyond the dualities of pain and pleasure, life and death, happiness and sadness, and just focus on the source of all of those pairs of opposites. And you'll be free from duality and have a peaceful mind. Uh, she says, without discernment, oh dear, they read religious books as parrots recite Rama in a cage. Reading the Gita becomes an excuse. I have read the Gita, and I am still reading it. Why are you groping like the blind? If you are wise, you will turn your attention within. Shiva is there. And so, she's and one of the last pieces of advice she says is, do good to others, for that is the real religious practice. And, um, all right, so now we're moving on to Mirabi. So she worshipped Krishna, and she lived from about 1498 to about 1550, born in Rajasthan to a Kshatriya family, and she considered herself already married to Krishna. So it's interesting her, um, I'm just going to read here. So the Afghan empire in northern India was disintegrating. Muslim chiefs fought to carve out kingdoms for themselves. The Rajputs battled back, so that's her, the warrior caste. But plagued by infighting, they could not unite. Mirabi's family, the rulers of Murta, arranged a marriage for her to the heir apparent of another Rajput state. She refused to conform to the household customs of her in-laws as she considered herself already married to Krishna, whom she worshipped as her divine husband and protector. Her father and her husband were killed in battle, then her father-in-law was killed, and the next king to come tried to poison her by offering poison food to Krishna, knowing that she would want to eat the leftovers, which was called prasad, prasadam. And, but when she did, it turned to nectar, so the attempts to kill her, Krishna saved her from repeated attempts to kill her. So I will now read, so this is page 15. She says, oh, my companion, I have beheld Shyam, the son of Nanda. So Shyam means black. Krishna is black colored, He's black skin and long flowing hair. So she's going to talk about how he looks. But this is Bhakti Yoga. She's meditating on the beautiful form of Krishna as if he's her husband. And that's how she's going to overcome the cycle of birth and death. So I have beheld Shyam, the son of Nanda. I have lost all consciousness of my surroundings and worldly shame has fled. How beautiful are the crescent moons shimmering on his peacock plume crown. 
He wears a tealock mark of saffron set between his lovely eyes. His crocodile earrings glint against his cheeks, and his dark locks play in the breeze. The Lord wears the garb of a dancer. His beauty has charmed the whole world. Miro would sacrifice her all to every limb of Lord Giridhara. Mira has been singing the glories of Govinda and is immersed in joy. The king sent a snake in a basket. They came and placed it in Mira's hand. I washed and came to look at it. And behold, it was the black stone of Vishnu. The king sent a cup of poison, but my lord turned it in to, uh, into nectar. When I washed my hand and drank, behold, it was nectar. The king sent a mattress of thorns, saying, Give that to Mira to sleep upon. When evening came, a mirror lay down. Behold, it was a bed of flowers. Mira's lord ever stands as her protector and saves her from danger. She wanders recklessly, drunk in adoration, offering herself to Giridhara in total sacrifice. I am mad with love, and no one understands my plight. Only the wounded understand the agonies of the wounded. So I'm going to now skip around a little bit. Mira says, my pain will subside when Shyam comes as the healer. So these are all different names for Krishna. Dispensing with worldly shame, I came to sit with the holy men. I felt joy in the company of the devotees. On beholding the world, I wept. The king gave me a cup of poison. I drank it down with joy. Mira's love has set in deeply. She accepts whatever comes. Uh, on the banks of the Yamuna, a flute is heard. The flute player has captured my heart. My soul has not strength to withstand him. He is dark against the dark waters of the Yamuna. On hearing the sound of the flute, I lose consciousness. My body is like stone. Mira says, O oh Lord Giridhara, come quickly and end my pain. Without thee, I, cannot en I can enjoy no peace. Mira's heart cares for nothing except the beautiful Shyam. So to it, overcome the pain she needs the embrace of the beautiful form of krishna the original vishnu so that's bhakti yoga all right so that covered part b questions one and two in the bhagavad-gita why does krishna tell arjuna that learned men grieve not for the living nor the dead and in what way did the women bhakti poets fulfill krishna's advice to arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. So now part A question one is what, how is Buddha's philosophy in the first sermon, which is the Four Noble Truths, and the Dhammapada similar to and different than the Bhakti philosophy described by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhakti poets? Okay, so they're very similar in the respect that Buddha was a Hindu. He was born in the entire tradition that worshipped Vishnu but he then rejected the idea of an individual self. And if you don't believe in an individual self, then you don't believe in the supreme self, which is what Krishna claimed to be. So the main parallels are, they both say you have to control your sense desires to escape the cycle of reincarnation. You have to have a calm mind by not being overwhelmed by desires and the dualities of desiring happiness and trying to avoid pain the you know all the dualities the pairs of opposites it's cold it's hot all the things that agitate the mind both the bhakti yogis and the bhagavad gita and the buddhists or the buddha himself is saying you have to control that and you need to escape from this painful life and try to achieve nirvana they also both say that but the main difference is the Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhakti yogis say the way to escape from the cycle of reincarnation is not to have a secession of all desire, but to focus all your desire on serving God, the Supreme Self. That's the main difference. So now I'll just go through a little bit of the first sermon and the Dhammapada and link it back to a few examples from the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhakti poets. So the 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 first sermon this is after buddha achieved buddhahood enlightenment under the, the the tree he was he had been practicing asceticism with these four other monks to the point of almost starving himself to death then he renounced that as excessive and he and he found enlightenment while sitting under a tree and now he's coming back to preach the message so here's what Buddha says in the first sermon, he says, There are two extremes, O monks, which he who has given up the world ought to avoid. 
What are these two extremes? A life given to pleasures, devoted to pleasure and lust. This is degrading, sensual, vulgar, ignoble, and profitless. And a life given to mortifications, this is painful, ignoble, and profitless. By avoiding these two extremes, O monks, the Tathagata has gained the knowledge of the middle path, which leads to insight, which leads to the wisdom, which conduces to calm, to knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. So Krishna says all the same things. You need a calm, tranquil mind in order to achieve enlightenment and nirvana. Nirvana for the bhakti yogis is the bliss of reunion in a personal relationship with God, the personal God, whether you call God Shiva or Krishna or whatever other name. For the Buddhists, it's losing the identity of an individual self because that's the source of desire, as he'll go on to say. So he says, which, O monks, is the middle path, the knowledge of which the Tathagata has gained, which leads to insight? It's the noble eightfold path, right belief, right aspiration, right speech, right conduct, right means of livelihood, right endeavor, right concentration, right meditation. This, O monk, is the middle path. And then he gives the noble, the four noble truths. So this, O monk, is the noble truth of suffering, birth of suffering, decay is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering. Everything is suffering. Number two, this, O monk, is the noble truth of the cause of suffering, craving, which leads to rebirth, accompanied by pleasures and lust. So desire causes suffering. The third noble truth, this, O monks, is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. It ceases with the complete cessation of this craving. The fourth noble truth is that the way to stop desire is the noble eightfold path. So this, O monks, is the noble truth of the path which leads to the cessation of suffering, that noble eightfold path, that is to say, right belief, aspiration, speech, conduct, means of livelihood, endeavor, right concentration, and meditation. So the four noble truths are life is suffering, desire or craving causes suffering. To stop suffering, you have to stop desiring. And the way to stop your desiring is the noble eightfold path. That is very similar to Krishna's advice, but for him, the way to stop the suffering that comes from bodily desires is to realize you're not the body, that you're a soul, and that your function is serving the supreme soul, Krishna. So it's personal instead of impersonal. To get out of the cycle of reincarnation, focus on the supreme person. That's Krishna's advice. That's the advice from the bhakti poets. For Buddha, there's no mention of focusing on the supreme person. You just need to stop desiring. So, again, that's the, the, both Buddhism and the Bhakti Yogis are advocating enlightenment and freedom from desire. Just the way that they go about doing that is completely opposite. The one, cessation of all desires, the other, focus all, intensify your desires insanely on the personal idea of God. So now the Dhammapada, this is page 20. So this is a collection of sayings by the Buddha. And he says, and I'll just go through some and link a few of these ideas back to the Bhakti poets and the Bhagavad Gita. So he says, all that we are is the result of what we have thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. So you have good thoughts, you'll be good. If you have bad thoughts, you'll become bad. Uh, he who lives without looking for pleasures, his sense is well controlled, moderate in his food, faithful and strong, him, Mara, will certainly not overthrow any more than the wind throws down a rocky mountain. So Mara is the tempter demon that tempted Buddha when he was trying to achieve enlightenment. It's equivalent to the Hindu concept of Maya, the illusion of identifying yourself with the material body. So then Buddha says, the evildoer mourns in this world. He mourns in the next because his karma catches up with him. At the bottom there on verse 35, he says, It is good to tame the mind, which is difficult to hold in and flighty, rushing wherever it wishes. A tamed mind brings happiness. So that's the same advice that Krishna gives. I will, um, on paragraph 96, he says, His, the wise and venerable person, the arhat, his thought is quiet. Quiet are his words indeed. When he has obtained freedom by true knowledge, when he has thus become a quiet man, 
the man who is free from credulity but knows the uncreated, who has cut all ties, removed temptations, renounced all desires, he is the greatest of men. You know, someone who conquers a hundred thousand men is not as good as someone who can conquer himself, he says, in paragraph 103. Um, and, but that the paragraph 96 about being a quiet man, becoming tranquil, that is advice that Krishna repeatedly gives also, that you have to have a tranquil mind if you're going to see the Supreme Vishnu. Um, page 9, the left-hand column. After he says, making me his only resort, um, then you can control your senses. He says, but the self-restrained man who moves among objects with senses under the control of his own self and free from affection and aversion obtains tranquility. When there is tranquility, all his miseries are destroyed, for the mind of him whose heart is tranquil soon becomes steady. He who is not self-restrained has no steadiness of mind, nor has he who is not self-restrained perseverance in the pursuit of self-knowledge. There is no tranquility for him who does not persevere in the pursuit of self-knowledge. At the end there, he says, This, O son of Prata, is the absolute state. Attaining to this, one is never deluded, and remaining in it in one's last moments, one attains Brahma Nirvana, the absolute bliss. So the Buddhists are also telling you to aspire for Nirvana. The, the difference is that Krishna is claiming to be the source of nirvana, whereas the Buddha never says anything like that. So, on paragraph 160 on page 21, he says, Looking for the maker of this tabernacle, I shall have to run through a course of many births, so long as I do not find him, and painful is birth again and again. But now, maker of the tabernacle, you have been seen. You shall not make up this tabernacle again. All your rafters are broken, your ridge pole is sundered. The mind approaching the eternal has attained to the extinction of all desires. So the, the body maker is your own desires. And you need to, ex you know, you're seeking the extinction of all desires. So again, that's the, the way to extinguish all material desires, according to Krishna and the Bhakti poets, is by focusing on Krishna and intensifying the desire for Krishna. The, the goal is not to extinguish all desire and to extinguish the very self, which is the Buddhist goal. It is to come back to your true eternal self. And that's the difference between Hinduism and Buddhism, at least the theistic branch of Hinduism. So on page 21, up at the right-hand column, paragraph 166, Let no one forget his own duty for the sake of another's, however great. Let a man, after he has discerned his own duty, be always attentive to his own duty. So Krishna says the same thing on page 7. And that's a big parallel that we'll see when we get into comparing Krishna to Kant. I will now, let's see here, page 7 the bottom of the right-hand column. He says, Therefore, you ought not to grieve for any being. Have regard to your own duty also. You ought not to falter, for there is nothing better for a kshatriya than a righteous battle. Happy those kshatriyas, O son of Prata, who can find such a battle to fight come of itself, an open door to heaven. But if you will not fight this righteous battle, then you will have abandoned your own duty and your fame, and you will and you will incur sin. All beings, too, will tell of your everlasting infamy. So, do your duty. That's the thing. Regardless of the results, be attached to fulfilling your duty. And we saw the same advice in the Dhammapada. Now, if you look on uh, page 21, paragraph tw uh, 210, Buddha says, Let no man ever look for what is pleasant or what is unpleasant. Not to see what is pleasant is pain, and it is pain to see what is unpleasant. He who says that it, that it is not goes to hell. So on page 8, I just made a little note there. Krishna says, Looking alike on pleasure and pain, on gain and loss, on victory and defeat, then prepare for battle, and thus you will not incur sin. Then on page 22, 
paragraph 367, Buddha says, He who never identifies himself with name and form and does not grieve over what is no more, he indeed is called a bhikshu, a mendicant. So he does not grieve. So that's reminiscent of what Krishna says on page 7, on the left-hand column, Learned men grieve not for the living nor the dead. And then over on the right-hand column, he says, Therefore, you ought not to grieve for any being. Souls don't die. That's why you don't grieve for the living or the dead. If you're learned about the difference between the body and the soul, then all of the changes of the body, the pairs of opposites that arise, good fortune and bad fortune, day and night, cold and hot, you, you don't let those upset your mind, and you don't grieve, and then you're a true renunciate. So on... Back to page 22, paragraph 369. O Bhikshu, empty this boat. If emptied, it will go quickly. Having cut off passion and hatred, you will go to nirvana. Cut off the five senses, leave the five senses, rise above the five senses. O Bhikshu, a Bhikshu who has escaped from the five chains is called Oghatina, saved from the flood. So again, they're both aimed at nirvana. They both say you can only get there by controlling your senses and rising above material desires. They both say you shouldn't grieve for anybody because nobody's being harmed. But there's a big difference between Hinduism, the, especially the Vishnu-worshipping uh, form of Hinduism, and the Shiva-worshipping who believe in eternal personal God and eternal souls. You don't grieve for people, not because there is no self, which is what Buddha would say. You don't grieve for people because the eternal soul, the eternal self, never dies. So now we've gone over those questions, and I